in the world we live in, the main problem is poverty, ignorance, disease, backwardness, illiteracy, and the rest. The main problem of today's world is a massive underproduction of most of the worldly goods that humans need, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, jobs, housing, health care, all the rest. All of that is lacking. One billion people in the world we live in are on the verge of starvation because of the world food market situation and the fact that we have almost no food stocks left anywhere in the world. You've also got about two to three billion people right now who are living under one euro per day, under about a dollar and a half or two dollars. So Holdren looks at that world and says, the reason for poverty is overpopulation. I would say no. The reason for poverty is underproduction of all the main things. Question for Holdren. If you have a bunch of people and you want to give them all a hat and there are not enough hats to go around, what do you do? I say, manufacture more hats. Holdren says, start cutting off heads. That's Holdren. In being a follower of Bentham and Malthus and Darwin, in this administration of fanatics, Holdren is joined by others. Let's look at Cass Sunstein, who is the regulations czar. Sunstein is the pioneer of what is called behaviorist economics. He wants to nudge you or convince you to do certain things. The problem is the nudge is not a friendly nudge. The nudge is going to become a cattle prod and then it's become a bayonet, and then it's become a machine gun, and God knows what else. That's Cass Sunstein. He's a former law professor from the University of Chicago. Now, he quotes Bentham all the time. Sunstein is a guy who says that animals should have legal rights, including the right to be represented by lawyers in a court. Now, Sunstein, by most people's uh, standards, would be quite extreme. But in the Obama administration, Sunstein is a moderate. Sunstein wants to give legal rights to animals. Holdren wants to give legal rights to trees so that they could be represented by lawyers and they could block development projects because you need more trees. Well, again, I'm all for trees. You want more trees, plant them. During the New Deal, we had something called the Shelter Belt that planted a couple of hundred million trees across the midsection of the United States as an attempt to make the climate better. It was an attempt to deal with the Oklahoma Dust Bowl of the 1930s. The way you do that is to plant trees. Trees are fine, but again, uh, with Holdren, we're going to have trees represented by lawyers stopping uh, human needs from being realized. Generally speaking, the, uh, the Malthusian, zero-growth, radical environmentalist, ecological extremist movement of the late 60s and early 70s is the precursor that prepares the ground for the radical deindustrialization of the United States in the late 70s and then into the 80s, the so-called Great U-Turn, where the U.S. goes from being an industrial power to being a post-industrial uh, rubble heap. Uh, key moment is 1968 with uh, the foundation of the Club of Rome, Aurelio Pache and Alexander King. Alexander King once admitted that the whole purpose of the ecological movement was to stop the economic development of the third world and make sure that there would be fewer brown and black people in the world because this was a problem for the Anglo-Saxon master race, the way he looked at it. 1972, you've got this tremendous work of charlatans and crackpots, Meadows and Forrester, The Limits to Growth, which was that the world really should have ended already because the uh, raw materials are being exhausted at such a rapid rate. So out of that, you get the green movement, the greening of America, and the coming of something that you didn't have before, was a mass constituency for radical environmentalists. Uh, In particular, Malthus used to be a dirty word among leftists, because he was considered a British imperialist. Uh, Marx and Engels had to attack Malthus, because otherwise they couldn't function Uh, in uh, progressive circles. But by the 1970s, thanks to this, Malthus and Darwin become good guys when, of course, they're really uh, very bad and both charlatans and crackpots. So that's sort of the the preparation. You've also got people saying that a service economy is better, the so-called Triple Revolution Committee. You've got the government of Edward Heath in Britain and uh, Harold Wilson 
of the Labour Party, saying quality of life is more important than production. All of these are ways to begin arguing the idea of deindustrialization. The way you get it, though, big time in the U.S. is Paul Adolph Volcker of the Trilateral Commission, appointed by Jimmy Carter of the Trilateral Commission. Uh, and what Volcker then does is he gets the Federal Reserve and he raises interest rates to unprecedented levels, a 22% prime rate, meaning that for most people, the interest rates were 30% or even more. And that's for mortgages, for, uh, for various kinds of business financing and so forth. What Volcker was able to do was to essentially destroy the industrial base of the United States. Uh, it became impossible to produce with credit costing that much. Um, some people compared this to, uh, to Keynes, right? Keynes said, well, let's have uh, inflation as a cure for depression. And Volcker came back with, no, let's have depression as a cure for inflation. And that's pretty much what he did. He pitched the United States into an industrial depression, which has never ended, uh, wiped out large parts of basic industry, steel mills, chemical, rubber, uh, and all the rest. This is where the jobs went. If you remember Obama's bitter clinger quote, he says, 30 years ago the jobs went away, and now we have these bitter people clinging to God and guns and anti-trade. Well, how did those jobs go away? That was Volcker. The industrial uh, base of the U.S. was gutted and destroyed by Volcker, and with the environmentalists there, this could be greeted as something good. The, the resistance to this in the Democratic Party was paralyzed because, well, it's a good thing after all. We won't have any more smokestacks. Well, instead of smokestacks, you're going to have uh, a declining standard of living, and this is what goes together with it. Since about 1967, the U.S. standard of living has declined by two-thirds, and that includes uh, average hourly earnings. It includes the fact that uh, the usual measures of inflation don't tell you how much inflation has been. Uh, it's much more because you have to include medical care, insurance, and other things that are not really reflected in the market basket. You're working about six weeks more per year. So you've got a longer work day, a longer work week, and a longer work year. Vacations shrink, and the work year is extended by about six weeks altogether. The other thing that you've got is your commute is much further, and you're sitting in traffic for a total of about two to three weeks just sitting there, in addition to whatever the length of your commute would be. If you add all of that together in terms of the burden of economic life on the average standard of living and quality of life, you will find that the U.S. standard of living has indeed declined by two-thirds. You can look on shadow government statistics. Their index confirms my finding. It goes from about 300 in the late 60s, early 70s to about 100 today, meaning you've lost two-thirds of your standard of living. So deindustrialization leads to immiseration. It means that the middle-class standard of living is destroyed. You've also got more people working. It's not enough for the husband to work. The wife has to work. The kids have to work. The husband has to work two jobs, the wife two jobs, and all this that everybody knows about. So that is what deindustrialization has done. And that would have been difficult to do without the ideological preparation of green fanatics like Holdren, Ehrlich, Paddock, um, Meadows and Forrester, the Club of Rome, and collected uh, charlatans and extremists of the 1960s into the 1970s. The disease that we're talking about is uh, not limited to the U.S. Actually, it, it it's really originates in, in Great Britain with, the, with these people like Bentham and Malthus and Darwin. Uh, one of Gordon Brown's aides was recently so indiscreet as to say that they were talking about cutting the population of the British Isles by 30 million people. Now, that's way more than Hitler could have accomplished. Uh, and what it shows, again, is the anti-human fanaticism, the genocidal fury of the Anglo-American ruling elite, that they hate people and they're determined to exterminate people and that's what they're into. And uh, if you want to live with a ruling class like that, uh, it's going to be nasty, brutish, and short. The origins of, of uh, eugenics, uh, racist thinking, race science in the U.S. go back in particular to the Harriman family. Averill Harriman was the son of... Uh, of Harriman, the railroad builder, 
who had been attacked publicly by Theodore Roosevelt as a robber baron, as a public menace. So Harriman, as a parvenu, knew money, who had to go to Oxford and uh, talk to old money. He had a tremendous identity crisis and sense of personal insecurity. So what he wanted to do was to create himself a wonderful race pedigree that he too was part of the Anglo-Saxon master race. So his wife contributed to this famous gathering at the American Museum of Natural History, which was attended by Nazis as well as British and other race scientists, meaning charlatans and, uh, and proto-genocidalists, who came together with the idea of improving the race. So U.S. states got into the business of sterilizing people, denying marriage licenses. You have these stories, the Kalakaks and the Jukes in New York State and similar things. The Nazis actually said the U.S. has beaten us to the punch in terms of, of eugenics measures. Uh, so in, in some ways, they were actually following in the footsteps of what Harriman and this faction had done in the United States. Now, Bush the Elder, in his first congressional term, when he was representing River Oaks, Houston, Texas, uh, elected in uh, 1966, it was a, a district that had to be tailor-made, designed for him, uh, as part of a redistricting, so he could finally get elected after he failed to get into the Senate from Texas against Yarborough in 1964. Bush became the champion of eugenics. He brought in Shockley, Herrenstein, and these other uh, fanatics, right? The, the sort of bell curve school, uh, the precursors of, of that. In other words, uh, people who talk about racial inferiority of the non-white races and, and things of this sort. Uh, these people were uh, outside the boundaries of respectability because of the backlash against the Nazis. But Bush, the elder, did everything he could to make them respectable. He brought them to Congress. He let them lecture groups of members of the House and so forth. So much so that uh, Wilbur Mills, the head of one of the, one of the key House committees at the time, co coined the term Rubbers Bush, that uh, George Bush, the elder, was so interested in contraception for the lower orders that, uh, that he was Rubber's Bush. Now, the idea that, I think, with Bush the Elder was he believes in the Anglo-Saxon master race. The problem is if you believe in that, you got a problem of numbers because there are so many other people who are not part of this. So what are you going to do? You've got to do something to, to limit the population growth uh, and probably turn it around among the non-white populations in particular. So I think that is the one thing that Bush the Elder actually believes in as a fixed point of ideology. John P. Holdren, the current Obama population czar, John P. Holdren, the White House science czar, is very much in the tradition of this Harriman eugenics movement, uh, which was rubbing elbows with the Nazis in the 20s and 30s. Things like compulsory abortion, compulsory sterilization, uh, taking children away from parents, preventing marriages, marriage uh, licenses that you have to pay for, implants and other things to prevent birth. This is all in the, uh, the Nazi or quasi-Nazi tradition of the 20s and 30s. The mentality of oligarchy does not change. Um, we have to remember that uh, as long as there are human individuals, you're going to have the one, the few, and the many. There's going to be one person, small groups of people, and large masses. So this is always going to be with you. These are ontological categories of human existence. The problem you have is if you have the dictatorship of the one, that's a fairly clear-cut problem. If you have the spontaneous mob of the many, that's a problem that people can also recognize. But what you tend to have in human civilization is the rule of the few, the oligarchy, uh, the iron law of oligarchy, studied by uh, German sociologists in the late 1900s. Now, the purpose of an oligarchy is really only one thing. A tyrant can have a project, a mob can have a goal, but an oligarchy is there to do one thing, to perpetuate oligarchy, to give it more and more power and allow it to exist. The mentality of oligarchy always depends on the idea that there's an elite and a mass, and there can't be anything in between. There's really no room for a middle class in oligarchy. So the elite has to justify itself Based on what? Why should they rule? Are they smarter? Are they more efficient? Are they better? They're probably none of those things. They're probably inferior in many ways. So they've got to find 
other ways to justify what is an irrational principle of domination. So oligarchs generally find ways to argue that the mass of people are inferior, that their lives are not worth living, and indeed that they're closer to animals than they are to the elite. So whenever you have an oligarchical elite, they're always going to try to portray the masses as ignorant beasts, inferior, or whatever else it is, and, th and that's what we see.